All right, thank you. So hello, um, I'm the track host for this session. Uh, that means I get to introduce the speaker and I get to run around with the microphone. Um, I was, my name is Brian Borum. I work for a company called Weaveworks. Uh, and I was a program committee member actually reviewing the, the performance track. So I'm, I'm very pleased to say this is one of the sessions I, I wanted to see, I voted for uh, in the, the selection. It is uh, performance of systems and especially Kubernetes, very dear to my heart. So uh, with that, please uh, give it up for uh, Linux platform engineer at Indeed, Dave Chillock. All right, so this is uh, throttling new developments in application performance with CPU limits. As I, as I was introduced, I am Dave Chillick. I'm a Linux platform software engineer at Indeed. Uh, so first off, what in the world does that mean? That means I work on the OS. I am partially a kernel engineer, partially an OS engineer. Uh, prior to Indeed, I worked for a comp small company called Canonical, which owns a little distribution called Ubuntu. Um, I am a core developer for Ubuntu. I achieved those rights there, and I still maintain those rights. Um, but I was also attached to the kernel team there, so I, I have some credibility with, with kernel engineering. Uh, so before, before we go too far, I do work for Indeed. Uh, and at, at Indeed, we help people get jobs. Uh, we have 250 million unique monthly youth visitors. Uh, we have about 25 million jobs on our site, and we have one million employer-sponsored jobs. We have roughly 10,000 employees at the moment, of which about 2,000 are engineers. Um, so before we go too far, this is, what the, this is the roadmap for today. Uh, we're going to cover CPU limit basics, how you can think about them, how you can conceptualize them. We're going to talk about the problem that probably everyone in this room has been hitting. I'll talk about how we ended up reproducing that problem, which is actually really hard. And then we'll talk about solutions and workarounds that we came up with, and uh, we'll hopefully make your day. So starting with CPU limit basics. Who should care about CPU limits? Everyone that runs containers. Uh, Kubernetes, Mesos, Docker, Containerd, Lexi, anything that is using the underlying, CPU, underlying kernel uh, CPU limits or CPU quota system. How you set that in Kubernetes? Uh, you go into your pods, pod definition and set limits under resources limits CPU. Uh, you can set it to, in this case, 200 uh, millicores or requests CPU 134 millicores. Uh, I divide these into a hard limit and a soft limit. That's one of the things I kind of try to, try to conceptualize. Uh, I will use those terms interchangeably. When I say hard limits, I mean hard limit, I mean limits. And if I say soft, I mean requests. Uh, but what do these mean? Well, soft limits under the covers are using C group CPU shares. Uh, if you actually navigate to the CFS, sorry, the C group file system on your node, you will see under sysfs C group and then your container, uh, a file called cpu.shares. If you cat that file, you will see that it has the, usually the same number as the millicores that you requested in Kubernetes unless you've got some weird uh, mutating um, ingress things. Um, now what does that mean? What is that number? That number is a number of shares that you've given that process. The amount of CPU time you get for that process is proportional to the amount of shares for all containers on that node. So if you take the shares and divide it by the sum of all shares for all of the pods on that node and multiply it by the number of CPUs, that's how many CPUs you are guaranteed to be able to use. So I'll give you, let's do a little bit example. On our nodes, we have 88 cores, 88 core node. If we put one pod on that node that is requesting, requesting one CPU, how many CPUs are we gonna be get, how many CPUs could we use at max? Well, that would be 88. Minimum would also be 88 because we are the only thing on that node. Uh, we are not restricted by anything with CPU shares. Now, if we add another pod to that node, our minimum drops to 44, but we're still possibly able to use all 88 cores. We do that again with two, another uh, 2,000 millicore no, uh, pod, and we drop down to 22, and, and so on. We get down to 11. So, Basically, you can consider your requests as a floor for usable CPU for that pod, okay? Now let's look at hard limits. Hard limits under the covers use C group CFS bandwidth control. Uh, these containers are limited to using a quota amount of, of CPU time in a period. 
Notice that I said CPU time. Uh, if we go back into that directory under our C group file system, we see that uh, there's two settings for this, CFS period microseconds and CFS quota microseconds. For the period, it is by default set to 100 milliseconds or 100,000 nano uh, microseconds. For the quota, that is equal to the limit that you set for your pod. In this case, we have 10 milliseconds set or 100 millicores. After you've used all of the quota for your pod, you will hit throttling. And that is the source of the problem that everyone in this room is here for. All right, so you can think of throttling, uh, of the uh, limit as a ceiling for the usable CPU that your application or pod can use. CFS bandwidth control gives us a number of metrics that we can look at in order to uh, determine how our pods are running. Uh, and if we look again in, that C, in the uh, C group file system, we have a file called cpu.stat. It provides three metrics, NR periods, NR throttles, and throttle time. We'll start with throttle time because I think it's the least useful. Throttle time, but it's probably also what most of you are looking at. Throttle time is the sum total of time a thread in a C group was throttled. What does that mean? So that means if you have one thread in your application and it was throttled for 90 milliseconds, throttle time will increase by 90 milliseconds. If you have 100 threads in your, app, in your pod and it, each of those is throttled for 90 milliseconds, throttle time will increase by 9,000 milliseconds every 100 milliseconds. So when you're looking at this throttle time, it's kind of useless because you have to also know how many threads are actually running in your pod. What I prefer to use instead, which is more agnostic, is NR periods and NR throttles. So NR periods is the number of runnable periods that your application, the number of periods that your application was running. What does running mean? That means actually using the CPU, not blocked on I.O., not blocked on network, not blocked on something else, not sleeping, okay? NR throttled is the number of those periods that you were runnable where you actually used your entire quota, okay? So what we use at Indeed to determine how badly an application is being throttled is we use this calculation. So we take the change in NR throttled and divide it by the change in NR periods, and we call that throttled percentage. So basically, it's the percentage of time that you were running that you got throttled, regardless of how many threads you, were, you had. All right, so that was a lot of words. Uh, let's do a little bit of an example so we can all understand a little bit more thoroughly as to what I'm talking about. Um, we're gonna start with an unconstrained example. This little application requires 200 milliseconds of time to complete a request. So maybe it's a big application. Uh, if request comes in at time zero, we would run for 200 milliseconds, and then we would respond at 200 milliseconds if we were unconstrained. Let's now apply a 0.4 CPU quota or a 400 millicore limit to that application. Again, request comes in at time zero, but now it runs for 40 milliseconds and then is throttled, okay? And it does that again quite a few more times before it finally, uh, before it finally responds at 440 milliseconds. Every, I see everyone staring at the slides and being all attentive, this is great. All right, so what we get from our statistics, remember CPU.stat from earlier, is we're gonna get a CPU usage of 200 milliseconds. We still used 200 milliseconds, but we were, our throttle time shows that we were throttled for 240 of those, 240 additional milliseconds, and we had a throttled percentage of 80%. So we were throttled for four out of the five periods that I was runnable. Now if we were monitoring CPU usage, we see that CPU usage is actually 0.4 because 40 milliseconds, or sorry, 200 milliseconds divided by 440, uh, 500 milliseconds is 0.4 CPU, okay? That's not the problem we've all been seeing, right? All right, I see some nods, cool. So here's the problem. This is what the problem looks like. These are P95 response times of one of the applications running in Indeed's infrastructure. We notice first off that it's a bimodal distribution. We have some really fast instances and we have some really slow instances. Those slow instances are, are having two plateaus, one at 100 milliseconds and one at 200 milliseconds. If you ever see this kind of behavior in your applications, you should immediately think throttling 
because of those 100 millisecond periods. I was throttled at 100 milliseconds. I had to wait for that 100 milliseconds to expire before I could get more time to finish up the request. Or in the worst case, this 200 milliseconds, I was throttled for two periods before I got, got runnable again. But the question here is, why in the world is there that second, that bimodal distribution? We'll, we'll, we'll look at that in a, little, in a little bit. First thing you do when you see this kind of a problem is you look at your CPU usage, and that's exactly what we did. We see that there, we have a limit set at 0.6 CPU. Our nodes are, our applications are very dense. Um, but even looking at that, the average utilization on this machine, on this application was like 0.3 CPU. I clearly had plenty of time which I should have been able to use. And this is the problem that everyone's been seeing. However, if we look at throttled percentage, remember that bimodal distribution? Well, the slow nodes, those slow instances are being throttled 80 to 90% of the time. The fast instances were being throttled only five to 10% of the time. Okay, so how does this happen? How do we have low CPU usage with high amounts of throttling? Anybody? All right, good. You're in the right place then. First thing we did is we increased the CPU quota, the CPU limits for those applications. And instantly, the amount of throttling that both of those, those slow instances received was dropped to almost nothing. And our response, our P95 response times dropped from over 200 milliseconds down to 13 milliseconds, just like it should have been. Okay, so that's the problem. That's what we wanted to go about and fix. Let's recap, what do we know? We know that increasing the CPU quota mitigates throttling. But we also have all these questions. What are the root causes here? When we were looking at that bimodal distribution, we were trying to figure out what the, what the similarities were between those nodes, or what the differences were between those nodes. We came up with a few things. The slow nodes had high core count. The slow nodes were a newer CPU architecture. How in the world could a newer CPU architecture with more cores result in lower performance? That's exactly what we're seeing. The other thing that was kind of unclear is that there was a mix of kernel versions in there. So the, some of the fast nodes were running newer, version, newer versions of the kernel, some of the slow nodes were running newer versions of the kernel, but it wasn't really quite obvious where the distribution happened. And the other thing that we were looking at is we were looking at spectrum meltdown mitigations, because this was around the time that all of the spectrum meltdown stuff was coming through the pipes. We were getting new firmwares, new BIOSes, new mitigations in the kernel, and we run a very bleeding edge kernel. So the first thing I realized is that we were gonna have to reproduce the problem. In order to talk to the kernel community and really bring this to their attention and get some traction, I needed to prove to myself that I could reproduce this. One, it would aid in figuring out what the root cause of this was. But two, it would aid in proving to the kernel community that we had actually solved the problem with whatever change we came up with. So I went through, through a number of things that probably you've all tried to do. You run AB against your application, you run StressNG. I, I wrote this random bash, curl, bash script wrapped around curl in a sleep. And that actually kind of worked like half the time, but it gave me lots of false positives. And I couldn't really figure out what in the world was going on. Then one of my coworkers, uh, my coworker John, came up and said, if I set go max prox on my Golang application to three on these nodes, I can decrease the amount of CPU usage, simultaneously decreasing the amount of throttling, and decrease the amount of response times for that application. Well, that was super interesting and super helpful. So let's update what we know. We know that increasing the CPU quota helps us mitigate throttling. We know that decreasing the number of threads now in our application also helps mitigate throttling. So in Golang, you set go max procs, but in Java, if you move to the newer JVMs, I think it's U191 or newer, uh, sorry, 8U191 or newer, they're actually C group aware, which help to decrease the number of threads they spawn. Java's still really bad about spawning tons and th thousands of threads even after that, so it doesn't completely mitigate the problem. The other thing you can do is move from whole, from fractional to whole CPU shares in Kubernetes. This will allow you to use, uh, this will allow tell Kubernetes to task set, your CPU, task set your pods to individual CPUs. That's a nuance that I learned separately that I just happened to learn around this time. But what are our to-dos? We've gotta create that reproducer, and then we're gonna probably have to fix the kernel scheduler. So first, the reproducer. I wrote this thing called FibTest. FibTest is a multi-threaded calculation of the Fibonacci sequence. 
I didn't care what it did. I just didn't want it to be optimized the way I wanted to churn through CPU time and tell me that it used the right amount of time. It had two things, fast threads and slow threads. The fast threads calculated as fast as possible that, se that sequence, and the slow threads would calculate 100 iterations and then sleep for 10 milliseconds. And here's the key. I had to pin each one of those threads to each, each CPU. And this is actually open source and available on GitHub. Uh, it's not all that useful. I might integrate it into a pod to verify that this stuff continues to work uh, in the future, but I haven't done that yet. But if we run FibTest, uh, here we have, we're running it with one thread, one fast thread, and the rest are all slow threads. So one thread, 16 threads, one being fast, 15 being slow. And in the worst case, 88 threads, one being fast, 78 being 87 being slow. If we look at the performance, the number of iterations this application is able to perform, we see that it, in the single-threaded case, it performs the most number of iterations, which is kind of expected, because we have to dedicate time to context switching and everything else to those for that slow thread. Um, but we see 1,452 million iterations in the fast case over one second with 50 milliseconds of quota. And in the slowest case on 88 cores, we see 275 million iterations, which is almost 5x decrease in processing. But here's the key. The amount of time used dropped incredibly. If we look at the single-threaded case, we we're using 539 milliseconds in that period, right? in, that, in that second of time. 50 milliseconds times 10 periods of 100 milliseconds is 500 milliseconds. So we were expecting a little bit of overhead for the wrapper script to do some calculations in bash because it's slow, but you know, 539 milliseconds seems reasonable on the single-threaded case. On 16 CPUs, we're seeing 530 milliseconds of usage. That's a little bit less, but still not terrible. But in the 88-core instance, we see only 183 milliseconds of CPU usage. Okay, here's our problem. We're not actually getting the time that we were allocated. We were expecting that 88-core example to get 500 milliseconds or more. All right. That's actually a 3x difference in the amount of CPU you were able to use on that high core count machine. So if we run ftrace on this, uh, shout out to my good friend Steve Rostet, who uh, you know, inspired me to take photos of, of my audiences. Um, he actually wrote uh, tracing, uh, ftrace in the kernel, but he also wrote kernel, uh, kernel shark. So this is a picture of kernel shark run against fib test. We see, on, we, see we have our fast thread, and we have a bunch of slow threads. Oh, sorry, keep in mind this is on the 417 kernel, okay? So this is the kernel that doesn't have the problem. We see that the, the amount of time between the start of our fast thread and the, start, and the restart of that fast thread is 100 milliseconds, which is exactly equal to our period. And we see that that fast thread, which is meant to chew up as much CPU time as possible, is getting 48 milliseconds out of that 50 millisecond quota. That's exactly what we wanna see. If we move up to, to 418, we see that that same fast thread is only getting 35 milliseconds. Now at this point, you might notice that 35 milliseconds is awfully close to 34 milliseconds, which is awfully close to the number of CPU, the quota I've allowed minus the number of CPUs. So if I'd had, I had 50 milliseconds of quota, and the number of CPUs was 16, which is 30, so 50 minus 16 is 34 kind of convenient. All right, that's a little foreshadowing. But using this behavior, I was able to create, I was able to do a git bisect on the kernel, and I f identified the causal commit. And that causal commit is 512AC999. That number is burned into my head forever. It's like my best friend's phone number from when I was a child. But when you look at this, this commit, it is a fix for inadvertent throttling due to clock drift. How in the world did a fix for inadvertent throttling due to clock drift cause us to get inadvertent throttling, okay? So before I go on, this is the commit that a lot of you have been seeing for, a lot of the, uh, for the last few years. This is one of them. This actually fixes a problem that a lot of you have been seeing. So check your kernels, make sure you have this fix. But that's not the problem, that's not the fix that I needed. But we did hit that fix because there were still some older nodes that hadn't yet been updated with the, newest, with the kernel that had that. This is what a kernel, a, an application without 512AC99 looks like. 
the CPU usage on this node is 0.1 CPU. It's been given four CPUs of time, but if we looked at throttle percentage, it is all over the map, completely nonsensical, doesn't make any sense whatsoever in terms of the, uh, what it should be doing or how it's doing it. Now, if we looked at 512 AC99 more closely, we noticed that it did something additional to just fixing that inadverting throt throttling due to clock skew. It also fixed per CPU quota to expire on the period boundaries. Okay, so if you read the kernel documentation, which is amazing, by the way, if you, if you haven't read it, it's, pretty, it's actually pretty darn good the last few years. Uh, the C group CFS bandwidth control implies that you only are allowed strictly to use the amount of bandwidth that you are given every period, no more, no less. Well, this fix enforced that strict nature. Okay, so that gave me a clue. This also, this really is what required me to figure out what was going on. So let's update our real world versus that earlier conceptual model. The complications we have. We have multiple CPUs now. We often now have multiple threads, oftentimes thousands if you're running Java. Uh, and cores run at different speeds. I haven't touched this at all, but this is something that you should also take away from this talk. Since, every, since all of this is based on wall time and cores run at different CPU speeds, if your core is downclocked when you get running on the, on the processor, your performance is gonna be negatively affected because five milliseconds running at 800 megahertz is way less processing power than five milliseconds running at 3.6 gigahertz or whatever else your cores are able to do. So one of the things we did was made sure that all of our nodes are in performance mode. Last thing is that schedulers are hard. It's a little, you know, I've seen a few slides that say something is hard. Schedulers are definitely hard. Um, I went through and read a bunch of the fair scheduler and the core scheduling bits of the kernel and I discovered a few things. The quota that you give your application is divided into five millisecond slices and then assigned to individual CPUs. Here we go, we're starting to figure out why CPU cores matter, why pinning to cores matter. So for example, if you gave your application one CPU of quota, that means you'd get 100 milliseconds per period of time. That means five milliseconds if you take that 100 milliseconds and divide it by five milliseconds to get the number of slices, you have 20 slices per period. Well, on our nodes, we have 88 cores. If you only have 20 slices, that means I can't use 68 of my cores because I can't give them a slice right off the bat. And the last thing is that this per CPU quota will expire if not used within a period. Okay, so that was a lot of words. I'm gonna do another example here and show you exactly what's going on in the kernel, but we're gonna use a two core machine. Two cores, two threads, two separate workers, both pinned to their own, to their own uh, uh, CPU. Worker one is pinned to CPU, quota, to CPU one, worker two is pinned to CPU two. We have our current time here. We've given our application 20 milliseconds of quota, and this is the global quota bucket. So whenever an application becomes runnable, it has to go to the global quota bucket and say, hey, I need a slice, I need five milliseconds in order to run. That quota is then, when it becomes running, that quota is then transferred to the per CPU quota, okay? Right now, nothing is running, hence there is no quota on the per CPU quota queues. So if we advance a little bit, we see that worker one got a request and was running for five milliseconds. It had to transfer five milliseconds from that global quota bucket, transfer it to its per CPU queue, and then it was able to use that five milliseconds and make the respond to the request. If we let worker two do the same thing, great. We're down to 10 milliseconds in our, qu in our global quota bucket. But now, what happens if we actually had a smaller request? And this request only takes one millisecond to complete. Well, we still transfer an entire slice to, CPU, to, quota, to uh, CPU one. What happens to that last four milliseconds that gets left over after only using one millisecond? Well, if it only runs for one millisecond, that slice, the leftover bits of that slice are gonna persist on that per CPU quota. After five milliseconds, 
there's this thing called the slack timer, which is gonna return everything but one millisecond of slack back to the global quota. Yeah, I see, so I, dude, you, imagine my pain when I discovered this for the first time, and I'm just explaining it to you. All right, but what happens here? We've got one millisecond on, a C, on our per CPU quota that is not being used. Okay, great, that's fine, whatever. Now if worker two comes in and gets a request and it uses, uh, it, keeps using, it needs a lot of CPU to make this request, it's gonna transfer eight milliseconds from the global quota bucket, eventually expiring the global quota. Uh, it's now exhausted. What happens now? Well, it keeps running because it still had three milliseconds on its per CPU queue, right? But now, it's exhausted its per CPU queue and the global quota bucket is empty. What do we do? Worker two is now throttled. But what about that one millisecond on CPU one? <laughs> well, that nothing happens to that one until the end of the period, at which point we just expire it and throw it away. Okay, so one millisecond, that's where all of our problems have been. It's been this one millisecond. Think about the impact of this though. If you have one millisecond every 100 milliseconds that you can expire and you have an 88 core machine, that's 88 CPUs minus one because you have to have at least one thread that needed to be throttled. That's 87 milliseconds every 100 milliseconds that you could be, that you could lose due to these one milliseconds just being left over on these per CPU queues. That's 870 millicores or 0.87 CPU per pod, per container in each pod even. Actually, sorry, per container. 870 millicores that you could potentially lose if you have an 88 core machine per container. That's a lot of CPU we're losing. All right, so what are the solutions and workarounds? This is why you're all here. So some people have not gone this deep and you know, they've said just turn it off. I'm not an advocate of turning it off because it's now fixed. Let's look at the possible solutions. What could we have done? Uh, first thing we could have done is remove 512AC999, but that would have broken all of you that were hitting that due to clock skew. That was, not going to be, that was not going to be an acceptable solution to the kernel community, and I have higher standards than that as well. Other thing we could have done is we could have created a burst bank or rollover minutes. Uh, if anyone's interested in burst banks or rollover minutes, basically, instead of just expiring those one milliseconds, we could have stuck them back on the global quota bucket. Um, before, this was actually not doable because it would have created a uh, thundering herd problem on the global quota bucket's lock. So if you have 88 CPUs all trying to grab that lock to return their one milliseconds, you cause a lot of waiting because it's all synchronized based on time. And the last thing you can do is remove all per CPU expiration logic. And that's actually exactly what we did. We removed all the per CPU expiration logic. This took about five months of debate with the kernel community, uh, six patch iterations, one of which was actually written by the original CFS author. Uh, and we came up with the solution of just Leaving, them on the, leaving those one milliseconds on those per CPU queues. That has resulted in these two commits, and these are now applied in the 5.4 kernel, and I've also backported them to the Linux stable kernels. So hopefully distros are now pulling this in. Ubuntu has it because, well, Ubuntu Core Dev. Um, RHEL 7 is actively testing this, and I think this is in their QA, QA environment, and RHEL A2 has it as a work in progress, and it should be available hopefully soon. But what happened to fib test? Because that's what you're all wondering. How did the performance change? Well, the performance changed on our 88 core uh, example. We went for 50 millisecond quota times 10 periods. We got previously 137 milliseconds of CPU usage. Now after this change, we're getting 482 milliseconds of usage. That's almost a 3x increase in the amount of CPU time that application can use across all 88 cores. So what are the takeaways? Monitor your throttled percentage. That is the most application agnostic uh, metric that I like to use. My math doctorate friend likes to tell me that it doesn't mean anything, except for it really is a great indication for how badly your applications are being throttled and how badly their response times are being affected. Number two, upgrade your kernels. Number three, use those whole CPU quotas, because that'll mitigate this if you can't get the, your underlying platform or underlying cloud to upgrade their kernels. Lastly, increase the quota where necessary, because that's gonna be your, your only other mitigating factor.
or increasing your limits. All right, any questions? Raise your hand if you have a question so I can reach you with a microphone. Yeah, you raise your hand then wait for the microphone. Oh, are they exposed in Kubernetes? Are so the stats I, exposed I, in the Kubernetes? That's the question. Yeah, so the question is, are the stats exposed in Kubernetes? Um, unfortunately, I am not a Kubernetes pro. I'm actually quite the Kubernetes noob, which is actually why I was able to do this, because I'm much more experienced in the kernel. Uh, I'm fairly certain Kubelet exposes these metrics via the, the API, but you need to make sure that your monitoring and observability is actually monitoring those, those, those bits. It's actually exposed as NR periods and NR throttled is what it, set, what it set, sends out, but you have to do the math on it yourself. Anyone else? Yeah, so I was uh, tracking this uh, bug on LKML, uh, and uh, I noticed that it was merged, or is considered merged um, on 8th of November. Um, so first question is, what, what's the recommended solution in the meanwhile? Because the accepted solution for Kubernetes right now is just to disable limits. Okay, so that's, that's actually an interesting question. Um, Kubernetes, a lot of the people have gone through and tried to um, work around the 512AC999 problem by changing the periods. I do not recommend doing that. I very much so recommend getting that fix because that fix actually got merged roughly six months ago into, it got backported into all the Linux stable kernels six months ago. Um, if you are not able to get these patches, which they really are pretty much available everywhere at this point, uh, I would probably just increase your, C your CPU limits to avoid, I would increase the, the CPU limits by 10 times the number of CPUs in millicores. Does that make sense? Unfortunately, I don't think the uh, vertical pod autoscaler is going to behave well with this mechanism because it's going to be like, oh, you're not using your CPU, but you're still being throttled. I don't know if they use throttling. Um, if someone that knows the pod autoscaler better can clarify that, I would love to hear. But I would suspect that their pod autoscaler is not taking throttling into consideration or the fact that this is happening. Um, other than that, yeah, uh, you probably would want to turn off your limits. Um, at Indeed, what we did is we just increased the amount of limit that the applications were allowed to use. Um, <clears throat> does using the whole CPU shares have any benefit after this fix? Depends. Well, that, de that really depends. Um, it doesn't have any benefit for this problem after this fix. Uh, it might have a, a benefit in that you have uh, cache locality. Uh, you have, you're going to have warm caches on your cores. Um, you are possibly not going to context switch as often to other applications. You're not going to have con uh, contention on the core, right? Um, so yes, there is still a benefit to setting whole CPU limit, whole CPUs uh, to your application after this. Um, there is not as much of a, there's definitely not a reason to not use CPU limits after this though. Um, CP, CFS quota is working, is working fine again. Go ahead and use it. Hi, uh, can you expand a little bit more on uh, what you just said about uh, you don't recommend decreasing uh, the period? Uh, ah, we, ah. we decreased it from 100 milliseconds to 10 milliseconds, and it wor has been working smoothly. Yeah, so um, the reason for that is what's going to end up happening is you're going to throttle every period. And what happens is you're going to get a higher average and best case response time with a lower worst case in P95 response time. Did that make sense? You're not going to throttle for that 60, 50 milliseconds or something in the period. Um, the other problem with changing the period is the slicing is five milliseconds. You lose granularity in how much, uh, in how accurate the kernel is with your with your CPU usage. Um, so yeah, I I don't like that solution at all because the best case, your best case response times, if you're not looking at them, are definitely increasing if you're decreasing the period. Because does that make sense? Yeah. So like if, if your application takes. Uh, so to make it for the rest, for everyone else here, if your application takes, in his case, he set the period to 10 milliseconds and you give it a half, CP, a half CPU, that's going to equate to 5 milliseconds every 10 milliseconds. If your application requires 20 milliseconds to make a response, now instead of using 20 milliseconds to make that response, you're going to run for 5 milliseconds, 
be throttled for five milliseconds, run for five milliseconds, be throttled for five milliseconds, run for five milliseconds, be throttled for five milliseconds, a few more times, and then you'll respond in 40 milliseconds instead of 20. That makes sense? All right. Could you explain again briefly why using whole CPU shares mitigates this problem? Okay, so uh, remember that per CPU quota that I had? If you use whole CPU shares, you're only going to be running on one or two of those CPUs. So the quota is going to be allocated to your CPU that you're running on, and so all of your threads are gonna be using from the same per CPU quota, so it's less likely that you're gonna strand milliseconds on random CPUs. So what happens with Java is it tends to run asynchronous worker threads one per core, okay? So what ends up happening is you do an IO, it spawns it on core 88, and then nothing else from the application runs on core 88, and it strands a millisecond there. Does that make sense? So that's why if you bring all of those threads down to one core, they're all, using, they're all pulling from the same per CPU quota bucket. Uh, will restricting the number of threads still help after this fix? Absolutely. Threads are not free. Don't, don't treat them like, like that. Um, but it, it won't, I guess, yes, if you don't, if you can't do if you can't do the kernel changes, decreasing the number of threads will help. Um, I, as a kernel engineer, we're fans of doing things efficiently. Um, spawning 4,000 threads on an 88 core machine is not always the best strategy, right? Um, so decreasing the number of threads will increase your, uh, your performance of your application. Having a reasonable number of threads based on what you're doing is something you should always look out for. Will it be reasonable to uh, restrict them like, to sealing of your CPU request? Sorry, um, can you say again? Uh, restrict them to the sealing of your CPU request? Um, no, not exactly, not, not, perfect, not, not, not strictly. Um, depends on what they are. It's, it's very case dependent, right? So like, you might have, um, you know, if you allocate four CPUs, you might want uh, asynchronous buffered I.O. and you might want also um, network I.O. threads, right? You might want to have four of each, so you don't want to have you know, just one of each for each core, right? So it's like, it's really depending on what your application's doing. Anyone else? You want to take one last one? I, 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 I could go for all, all, all you know, another I, hour. But, I have yeah. to go do, do a talk next, so. Yeah, oh, oh, it's your turn? Okay. Hi, um, I was just wondering if you had any uh, advice or recommendations uh, around how bad throttling is um, in terms of like, should we be aiming for Processes never to be throttled, or is you know some amount of throttling okay and expected in day-to-day -day operations? Great question. Um, that's going to be very application dependent again. Uh, what I try to see at Indeed is I want to see zero to ten percent throttled time um, because I want our applications to be um, sized right in their pod, such enough such that I get decent amount of density of applications of pods per node without over-allocating, right? So it's, it's, it's really a, it's a value judgment. Do I care about the density of my applications on my node, or do I care purely about performance? If you care purely about performance, you should target 0% throttling all the time. If you care about density on your nodes, you wanna be as close to that limit. You wanna be skirting that limit, which means you're gonna hit throttling you know, every little bit, right? So I like to target us to having a little bit of throttling on all of our applications, but nothing excessive, because that gives us a lot of density. Oh, uh, that's a, that's, that's so the question a, that's, was peak or off peak? Yeah, so if it's peak or off peak, um, we actually target for uh, peak, peak times, um, but that is a work in progress that I think is gonna be my next task to work on. So I'll probably be playing with the pot, vertical pod autoscaler in the next year, maybe, maybe some other things. Maybe I'll be doing another talk like this about how we increase the density by awesomifying the vertical pod autoscaler. So. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dave.